Yeah, if you would you mind just saying who you are until we all know. I know who you are, but just uh, tell everybody. Thanks, Chair. My name is Aubrey Mayer. I live in London. And 20 years ago, formed a tiny and insignificant organization, which is called, in the horrible acronym, GCI, but it stands for Global Commons Institute. <laughs> and it engaged immediately with the issue of climate change because a book was published at that time by a UK economist, which was called, quote, quote, the economic management of the global commons. And it was specifically to do with climate change. And in a nutshell, they pursued an analysis which proved that it was cheaper to adapt to climate change than to prevent it. Not a little to do with the fact that the valuation of all the ecosystem services and people who were at risk from climate change were valued according to their income, which crudely meant that 15 dead poor people equaled one dead rich person. We begged them not to do this. I grew up in South Africa and I know about the politics of uh, discrimination. Um, but they said, go and get a haircut and get a job. <laughs> and when you've learned to say, sir, you can come to meetings like this and address it. Well, that led to the program that some of you may know, uh, certainly Matis does, because it's very much in sympathy with his footprint work called Contraction and Convergence. And the, this is really in response to David's very challenging question, which was, how do you get people to think in a time frame which is consistent with taking, as it were, the global interest, whether it's altruistic or not, but the, perhaps the global common interest, seriously as an issue of self-interest. And I would say, just as a blank statement, you absolutely have to break the economic stranglehold under which we live, where 15 dead China, Chinamen equal one dead Englishman, which is crudely what they were advocating. So in order to answer precisely, David, the, the challenge that you've raised, how do you get people to think? The, the one hideous opportunity of climate change is because it is so specific in that it is, as it says, we're transacted in the global commons of the atmosphere, and because the objective of the UN Treaty on Climate Change is so specific in respect of having to stabilize the concentration of greenhouse gas at a level which is safe and sustainable, stable, and because, because of the work of climate scientists and IPCC, the quote, quote, emissions contraction requirement that is consistent with achieving that stabilization is so very easy, in fact, to calculate. Uh, I won't go into the details here, but it is. And it is then very, very easy to draw out the kind of timelines of footprints, equalizing the footprints of the poor and the rich globally under the, that constraint of contraction which saves us all. You can communicate, perhaps across a generation, not much more than that, how easy it is to show what is required of all of us working together to a common agenda to actually deliver an outcome where your child, my child, actually has the possibility, all our children have the possibility of a globally secure commons weather system and, and so on. So the, the, absolutely the, the challenge is how do you communicate this and you immediately, of course, run into this are you an optimist, are you a pessimist, bad news turns people off, good news kind of encourages people, but also this incredibly tense axis between global and local. So my very specific question to each panelist is, in, in the light of that, which I regard as not so much good news as very usefully illustrative information, contraction and convergence, what concentration of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere within the next 40 years, not more than that, would you regard as being safe and stable? Thank you. That's a very specific question, but there's a lot behind it, obviously. So what, yeah. Julia, do you want to have a go at that? No. <laughs> The, the answer keeps coming down every time I get asked. Um, Hansen's come out with his latest uh, set of calculations, which is that 450 ppm is not going to give us 2 degrees, but 350 will. We are already above that. We are at 380. So clearly, collectively, we have to emit less than we do. I think the, the, the maths would still predict something like 1.5 to 2 tons, depending on which end you pick of that range, as being per capita the acceptable level of emissions. Um, 
work that out, we're talking about a 9 billion population in 2050. That suggests that you should be looking at 13.5 to 18 billion tons of emissions as against the 42 billion which we are achieving now or were last calculated 2004. It may be higher. So we are well over double the level of quote-unquote safe emissions. And that's, that's really the challenge. So we have to... Uh, you're quite right to point out there has to be a, a convergence. There also has to be a speed issue. We have to move in a direction, different speeds. Um, I think we are in the same boat. Uh, I think a lot of what I mentioned earlier about the lack of a common human understanding is I don't think people are enough recognizing or giving credence to the fact that we are in the same boat. It's got a massive gaping hole somewhere near the keel and it is sinking. We better act fast. generational aspects of this. You, you come from the financial world. Is your work on pricing biodiversity and fossil fuels, is that catching on? Are you still, I mean, when this began, you must have been slightly an oddball in that world trying to do this work. In answer to that point about the generational mm -hmm. perspective, is it now catching on? Are people in your world seeing through the price on this? I think that it's fair to say that uh, compared to two years ago, the level of awareness is extremely different today. Uh, two years ago, I couldn't have contemplated that I would be at a World Bank requested meeting in Washington at the Smithsonian, where they're signing an agreement with the Smithsonian on tiger conservation, and that the subject of my speech, which has been agreed with them, is economics of biodiversity and its implications for the development paradigm. Two years ago, if you had said I'd be doing this, I would have said, you're, all, you're smoking controlled substances. Yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, there, there, is, there is a shift. There is definitely. Thank you very much. Okay. There's a question up there. Oh, you've got the mic. Okay, then the lady at the front. Okay. okay. Uh, I have two, next, two questions, and they're kind of related. Uh, the first one is for Pavan. Um, I also work Sorry, with... Can say who you are and where you're from? Right, I'm going to do that. Um, Mark Lancaster, and I work with Matis at Global Footprint Network. Um, so Pavan, as a banker and somebody who's been uh, having these conversations in many places with many people, uh, question that I have is, what will it take? What do we have to do to really remind governments? You say they've forgotten what the role is, and I agree with that uh, in many, many ways. What does it take to move, especially major governments first, to really do as Mata suggests, and that is to value uh, our ecological footprint alongside GDP with equal value or maybe even more value. So that's the first question, and I think it's a really major one because until we begin to value those ecological services as quintessential for life on this planet, uh, then everything is lost. And the second question is related, and, and in some ways it's a more difficult question, I think. Uh, I think that there are lots of global answers and we really need to work together and the, it's a big picture approach. But fundamentally, you know, I agree with our friend uh, from Nevada that uh, if we don't find a way, every individual on the planet, to reconnect with our own uh, roots uh, in the dust of this planet, uh, the trees, you know, flora, fauna, the whole thing, then we forget, we easily get into the paradigm as governments and leaders and just as individuals of, of having no sense that there is a global commons and there, there, there's this very thin layer that we share together. So it seems to me that while we need to be talking about global so solutions, we also have to be saying, what does it take to move the hearts and minds of individuals to recognize that individually I will not exist if I don't have a connectedness to the earth. And that's aimed at, at Pavan, is it? I mean, I guess presumably part of the problem is that uh, more than half the world's population lives in cities. But uh, That's part of the problem, but also potentially part of the solution, because uh, to communicate and spread a message across into a community which is as dense as a city is actually easier compared to the, the traditional. But uh, let me try and uh, grapple actually the, the rather wide uh, area that you've, uh, that you've asked about uh, by, by saying that today it is no longer the case that we have a, um, a, a, a majority in favor of no change as far as the, the accounting aspects are concerned. And 
Uh, I'm not only saying this because the two of you are from uh, Global Footprint Network.